Hey everyone, today I wanted to talk about a really beautiful problem that lies at the intersection of computer science, mathematics, and probability. The secretary problem. Thinking about this problem allows us to dip our feet into optimal stopping theory, a branch of math that has widespread implications across your entire life. Whether it's in finding a romantic partner, hunting for a house, or searching for a parking spot. The content for today's video is heavily inspired by one of my favorite books of all time, Algorithms to Live By, written by Brian Christian and Tom Griffiths. We'll only be talking about the content of the first chapter, but that doesn't mean the rest of the book is worth any less of your time. On the secretary problem, the book says it's simple to explain, devilish to solve, succinct in its answer, and intriguing in its implications. So let's dive in. For today's problem setup, let's say we're in San Francisco looking for an apartment to live in. For each one that we tour, we must decide whether to take the apartment or wait for a potentially better one. The twist, once we pass on an apartment, we can't go back to it, presumably because someone will snatch it up right after you. So the goal is to maximize your chances of picking the best apartment. But how can we do that without seeing all the options first? We need a way to collect some data to better understand the landscape before committing. But what if we pass on the best option while doing so? It's the ultimate catch-22 one that could end up costing you a lot given the high cost of living in San Francisco. Another thing to note is that we don't have access to a metric that objectively ranks each of the apartments we see. We only have their ordinal ranks or how they stack up against each other. To solve this dilemma, let's start small. Having only one choice is trivial. We have to choose that one. Having two gives us a 50-50 chance of choosing the best one. Having three is a little more interesting. When looking at the first apartment, we don't have any additional information because we can't compare it with the next two. Either we select it on the spot or move on. When looking at the last apartment, we don't have any agency. We have to choose that one because we can't go back to previous options. But when looking at the second apartment, we have a little bit of both information and agency. So what if we choose the second apartment if it's better than the first one, but reject it in favor for the third one if it's not? An easy way to analyze this solution is to simulate it thousands of times. So let's write a simple Python script to do so. The code I'll be showing on screen is a little more intuitive to understand, but not the most optimized. I'll link all the code from this video along with some more optimized versions down below. After our imports, we create a list of our apartments with one being the best and three being the worst. We then choose how many times we want to run this simulation. The more times we run it, the more accurate our approximations will be. Also, we create an empty list that'll hold which apartment we choose each time. For each run, we shuffle the order of the apartments and choose the second one if it's better than the first. Otherwise, we choose the last one. After graphing these results, we see that we chose the best apartment 50% of the time. While it's still not 100%, it's much better than if we just chose randomly which would yield us only a 33% probability of choosing the best one. The strategy that we utilized is known as the look then leap strategy. We only ever look at the first apartment, never choosing it no matter what, and then leap onto the next apartment that's better than the first. Obviously, we might reach the end of our available apartments, in which case we're forced to choose the last one. But during the look phase, we get a lay of the land, and during the leap phase, we choose the first apartment that beats everything we've seen when calibrating our knowledge and expectation. So what happens if we have more than three apartments? Is there an optimal threshold at which we should shift from looking to leaping? Well, let's find out. Here's a simple function that takes in the number of apartments we have to look at, n, and the number of apartments before we switch from looking to leaping, k. We generate a list of integers that represent our apartments. Again, remember, the smaller the number, the higher the rank of the apartment. Then we iterate through the first k apartments and keep track of the best one we've seen so far. During the leap phase, as we're looking at the rest of the apartments, we select the first one that beats everything we've seen previously. So let's check our n equals 3 example from before. We're going to iterate across all possible values of k which in this case is 0, 1, and 2. Remember that k is our threshold where we switch between looking and leaping. k equals 0 means there is no looking phase and we always choose the first apartment. k equals n minus 1 means we always leap at the last apartment, essentially leaving us with only one option. For each run of the simulation, we keep track of whether or not we chose the best apartment, which is indicated by if the return value of our function is 1. After running the code, let's plot the results. On the x-axis, we have our threshold value, or k. 
On the y-axis, we have the proportion of how many times we chose the best apartment. We can see how this aligns with the intuition we developed earlier. In the case for three apartments, always look at the first apartment and then leap, guaranteeing that you'll select the best apartment 50% of the time. And the amazing thing about our code is that now we can run it for any number of apartments and for all values of K. For four and five apartments, we can see that we should leap after looking at one and two apartments respectively. As we go from 10 to 100 to 1000 apartments, we see that the optimal K seems to lie just above a third of the number of available apartments. Also, the probability that we choose the best apartment out of the entire bunch seems to be converging towards 0.37. In reality, the optimal threshold is n over e, and the probability that we choose the best apartment converges to 1 over e. e is known as Euler's number, or about 2.71828. Our simulation actually exhibits these theoretical values as we increase the size of n and the number of times we run the simulation. What happens if you don't know n, or the number of apartments you're looking at? Well, the great thing is that you can also use your time frame. Simply allocate around 37% of your time to the looking process and get ready to leap after that period is over. So if I have only a month to find an apartment, spend around 11 to 12 days simply looking, and then with the remaining time, choose the first one that beats everything you've seen previously. One fascinating property of the strategy is that your odds of choosing the best apartment actually remains the same as n increases. That means Using this strategy in a pool of a million apartments, you still have a 37% chance of choosing the best one, which is a significant boost over the one in a million chance someone choosing randomly would have. I mentioned earlier that finding the perfect soulmate is also technically an optimal stopping problem. Those that don't believe in love at first sight may argue that you may need to gather data before you know if the person you're dating is the right match for you. But there's a critical facet of dating that we haven't accounted for. Maybe you've allocated 37% of your dating life to simply searching, and then you finally think you see the one. You know that the math is indisputable, and you excitedly propose, only to get rejected. Whoops, that's kind of a major factor our model didn't account for. So how should we accommodate? Well, let's update our simulation. This function takes in an extra parameter p, and when you choose to accept a candidate, you might get rejected with probability p. Comparing these three graphs, we see that if the probability of getting rejected is higher, we probably want to have a shorter looking phase. And if the probability is smaller, then we can expect to be a little more selective. One final twist is if we can go back to previous candidates. We model it such that if you choose someone, they'll accept with 100% probability. But if you come back later, you only have a 50% chance. Here are the quick code changes for that. Again, the data shows that with this setup, we can expect to get the best apartment around 61% of the time. The concept of optimal stopping theory also applies to the common dilemma of searching for parking. Let's say you're in a car looking for a place to park on a one-way street, so you can't turn back. If you see an open spot, should you stop searching and take it, or valiantly continue onwards in hopes of a closer one? The challenge is that you only have information about the availability of a parking space when you are directly beside it, forcing you to make an immediate decision to either take the spot or risk the uncertainty of finding another. As you get closer, the potential value from having to walk less increases, but at the risk of passing your destination to find a spot. Well, thankfully, we have math to the rescue once again. The one parameter we need is what percent of the spots are taken, assuming they're evenly distributed. Intuitively, you might think that the more parking spots are occupied, the further away you should be willing to park. I was unable to reproduce these numbers exactly, but the rates that the book offers are as follows. We can see how one should start looking for a parking spot further out as the proportion of spots increase. What this essentially means is that once you are this number of spots away from your destination, you ought to take the first empty spot you see. Anyways guys, if you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend checking out Algorithms to Live By. It's a jam-packed book filled with lots of tips and tricks about how to apply computer science to your everyday life. Running simulations on my computer has always been a very fun pastime of mine. It's like you're creating your own little play world and you can run thousands of instances of it at the same time. Really makes you wonder if we're all in one as well. But if you'd like to see more videos about the other chapters in this book, more videos where I run simulations or even a book review, let me know in the comments down below. But until next time, bye-bye.